Hello, so this is going to be a video on a really nice Swiss Geiger counter. This is the Swiss Landis and Gia, or Landis and Gia, in our idea it's pronounced, EMB 3 meter. Now, these were used from some point in the 1960s up until, I guess, the 80s or the 90s. Um, I've got a service booklet for it, which I'll quickly show you in the briefcase. So I ordered this from a seller in Germany. Um, I think it was about £140, £150, total, including postage. Very impressed by the postage. They sent it either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, and it arrived on the Friday. So two days from Germany to the UK. Excellent. Um, now, what's good with this one is it's actually a really, really good Cold War Geiger counter. For the time it was made, probably one of the best ones, I should think. It doesn't surprise you being Swiss, but I'll go over the features and you'll see why in a minute. Now, there can be a couple of variants of this Geiger, so I'll try and go into that now, and I can't find much information about them online. So I'll point that out when I get to it. So basically, I'm assuming if that's the plastic case they originally came in, because it did have a foam cut out that fit it, but again, somebody could have done that at some point that wasn't to do the Geiger counter. So let me move that a bit closer and aim that down there like that. So we'll look at that in a second. So just to show you the service manual of this one. So yeah, there is the service manual. So basically, it was first tested in 1961. Um, then 66 and 69 and 73 and I'm assuming 86 was the last ever time it was tested or retired and they tested it with, on 100, uh, 100 and then 20 Ronken um, 1000 which is still 1 Ronken basically and 200 milli Ronken and 10 and 5 milli Ronken per hour so they basically did a couple of tests on each of the scales and it passed all of them with flying colours um, by the look of it unless it's the person's handwriting every single one of them was pretty much spot on the number and it was allowed 20 to 30 percent drift depending on which range it was on uh, which is actually quite a significant bit of drift on a lot of them because a lot of them say something like five to ten percent but regardless it pretty much scored where it should have scored on the thing so there we go now a note about calibration with these geiger counters um what i need to point out with these is that some of them came with a strontium 90 source this one didn't um, so if you're worried about getting one with a strontium 90 source or not, there's a couple of things you can look into, uh, which I can hopefully demonstrate to you here from as far as I can tell. So basically on the top down bit of this Geiger counter, what's really nice is you've got a colour coded thing and I'll zoom in on that in a bit. But what that does is it basically tells you if you've got a reading of this, this is how dangerous it is. So even if you know nothing about radiation, it literally tells you right on there. Obviously you need to speak German to read this, but um, you know, it does tell you. And it's basically saying these ranges are pretty safe. You should be worried if it's in these ranges. If it's in red, you've got a serious problem. Um, and basically the top one's essentially telling you to get into a fallout shelter or if you've come outside to take a reading, you know, get your ass back in. You're, um, you're not meant to be experiencing this levels of radiation. So you've got a little clip here, which I assume is just for carrying it like that if you wanted to. Uh, you've got a neck strap, which I need to sort out because whoever put it on, put it on skew with, which really irritates me with straps like that. Um, I did dismantle the unit to have a look inside it. So what you've got here, that's the battery cover. It takes two D-cells. Although I think older models of this might have had a different battery type and it, these have essentially been converted with a little plastic holder to take two D-cells. So I assume originally it had a battery close to three volts which was like sort of a long cylindrical battery. Um, you can see a little sticker for it there that says EMB3. So this is the selection switch which basically goes between battery check and the radiation ranges. And right. If this was a model that included the strontium 90 bit, the check source, there would be a little tiny lever here. They've put a plastic plug in it. I'm assuming there might have been some other sort of control there. But what this plastic cover did, basically, underneath there, there'd be a little lever, and that would swing the strontium 90 source in front of the Geiger Muller tubes and away from them. That way, swing them in front, you get a reading. Swing them away, you don't get a reading. And the idea was, it was about, I believe, originally between 100 and 200 milli Ronken per hour source of strontium 90. The reason being that it would, you know, overwhelm the first Geiger Muller tube and it would give you a pretty good reading on the sort of beefier Geiger Muller tube, what the readings were. So there's that. So this is what the front of the counter looks like, if you like. Um, this is the only side that's really got anything interesting on it. Here's the flap. So that's a thick bit of either steel or aluminium. And what that does, I know it's relatively thin, but you know what I mean, it's got a decent bit of weight behind it, it's pretty dense. So how that works, there's your beta window. So underneath there's a mesh and then there's a bit of foil. And both the Geiger Muller tubes sit under there. In theory, you could actually take this bit off, I guess, if you wanted to, using a screwdriver. But the idea is that if you look at the circuit board underneath, both the GM tubes are there. And this runs in a, this, this is very similar, without a probe, to um, 
a Soviet DP5 because basically it uses a tube that's a bit like an SBM20 and a tube that's a bit like a Soviet SI3BG and the idea is that they cover different radiation ranges. You've got a very sensitive tube and a not very sensitive tube and depending on how strong the radiation is you'll get a reading on one of the things. So that's how that works, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but again, pretty clever to be done at the time and I do quite like these Geiger counters where the probes are actually, or well, not the probes, the um, Geiger Muller tubes are inside the unit so you don't need a probe. But speaking of probes, if we flick this around, this is the other bit where you might have a different feature. That is the on-off switch, or essentially you hold it down to get a reading, and then when you take your finger off of it, it turns the unit off, so you're not wasting batteries, similar to how the Soviet DP-63 works. This is basically actually very similar in design as well as the Soviet DP-63, just with a much greater range of you know radiation it covers. And here, you've got like a little plastic insert, and what this is, if this was a model that would have the external probe on it on a wire, that would come out from here. Obviously what they've done is all the units that didn't have a probe but just relied on the internal GM tubes, they've put this sort of plastic bit sealed inside so you can use that as a little storage container and contaminants can't get into the actual circuit board area of the Geiger counter. So that's that nice and tight, so that's quite a nice feature. It's quite nice on these that when they change something on them, they actually you know do a proper job of changing it rather than just pulling a part out and leaving a gap. So for example that's got that in there instead of um, that bit. And that bit's got a plastic plug in there, so there's not any holes in it. So, as I said, that's the back with just a little another carry sort of handle on it. That's the front where you've got the sort of radiation window. And then this is the top. So for all accounts and purposes, you're always going to be looking at this bit. So, if we zoom the camera in on this bit, we can look at the ranges properly. If I can get the angle right, where you can actually look down and see it properly. So if you want to have a quick look at the label in case you can read German or just want to run it through Google Translate but basically it's telling you these are different ranges, this is what you need to do at different ranges so what you do, you press the button in, that does the battery check look and a light comes on behind the thing, I don't know if you can see that so that's doing a battery check, so it's telling me the D cells I've got in there at the moment um, are getting a bit low but they're in the green area you want them to be in a really good pair of like you know fully charged D cells or brand new D cells will actually go off the scale on this so there you go, there's that Right, so the first setting is the 100 Röntgen per hour, well, maxes out at 100 Röntgen per hour. So this is basically zero Röntgen at one left side, but, you know, it's designed to be very high ranges. This is also a non-linear scale, which I really like. So it starts off small, and then the distances, you know, between the radiation doses get bigger and bigger. It means that you can basically have more numbers on one scale, if, as long as you've, you know, programmed the Geiger right, I guess, to do it. So... If I do that, obviously, no reading as you'd expect, because I'd be very worried if this scale started going up. But you might hopefully be able to see there's a light coming on when I do that. Right, next scale is the milli Ronken per hour scale in yellow, which is like, the, you need to be worried, levels of radiation. So it starts off on zero again. The first marking is 20 milli Ronken per hour, and it goes all the way up to 1,000, so 1 Ronken per hour. So basically, on the low Ronken end of the radiation, you probably want to use this scale because it's more sensitive than using the red scale um, you know it's quite nice how they sort of cross over a bit um, and then the scale that's the most useful for most people is this one now I don't actually know if the arrow just moves a bit anyway when you put it on this scale because every time I try to flick it to the scale it almost comes on like it's actually taking a reading but I'd assume you have to hold the button down for it to take a reading so it might just be the sort of um, arrow or pointer resetting a bit. Anyway, what's interesting with this scale, if it's in frame properly, is when you hold it out, see that orange flash? That's it counting. So, although there's no speaker on this, what is nice is that basically every time it does a count, um, that flashes. So it actually you can use it as a physical old-fashioned Geiger counter if you want to count that. You could count counts per minute, couldn't you? Or whatever. Or counts per second. So you could say uh, it might be doing one or two counts per second, therefore 60 to 120 counts per minute. But anyway, it's a bit higher than background because I've got some radiation sources nearby that I've taken out the safe and we're going to be running some tests on this. Only annoying thing of this Geiger counter I found, I mean, it'd be nice if it had a speaker in, that's my only complaint. Maybe it would be possible, I don't know, to mod in a speaker into that section somehow. Um, but, you know, I'm going to leave it as it is because this is a really nice Geiger counter. Only issue is it's absolutely fine when you have it this way up. However, if you have it horizontal, although the arrow still works properly, the kind of scaling bit... Um, you know, this bit, that kind of does that, where it goes between scales, I guess because it's not held firmly in place. It, you know, it might 
do with a bit of a tighter spring. I said that's not essential because it's meant to be used standing up anyway. So what we're going to first do is see what happens if I put one of my tins containing a few radioactive items next to it with the beta window closed. So there's that counting. Let's put that there. As you see, it counts faster. And we're getting a bit of a reading here. So let that stop where it's going to stop. And it looks like it's going to stop about 0 0.5 millironcgen per hour. So not that scary. Is that actually ticking? Or is that just it shaking slightly? I'm not sure. But anyway, that's um, you know not very high, 0 0.5 millironcgen per hour. That's with the beta window closed. If we open up the beta window and put that in the same place or similar place, we'll get a slightly higher reading. Yeah, I think it was just it vibrating before. As you can see, the radiation reading is higher now because the beta that penetrates a bit more is getting through, and I've put it a bit close to the GM tubes because I had it out there before. So, okay, that's getting to about one millironcgen per hour, which isn't really scary, but if you're ever out and about and you've ever got to one millironcgen, you'd be wondering why the hell radiation was like that at background anyway. So, there we go, there's that. Now, let's try some actual check sources with it. So, what I'm going to do first. I'm just going to actually zoom that out ever so slightly so you can see a bit more of the operation of this device. There we go. And I want to maybe get this a bit closer to underneath the camera so you can see the scale better. Let's have a look. Can I get that at a really good angle? I think that's probably the best I can do it. Hopefully you can see the scale all right, but it's always a bit irritating with light reflection doing these. So first, let's try closing the beta window and putting the DP63's radium scale in front of it with the beta window closed. So this should only be hard beta and gamma entering the Geiger counter now. So it looks like it might go off the scale for the lowest reading. But most of the energy coming off of this is going to be alpha and beta. So it's stopping about 4 millironcgen per hour. However, what you'll see now, if I lift this flap up and do the same thing, it's going to be much, much hotter. Because obviously, a lot more of the beta energy is getting through, the softer beta rays are getting through. There we go, so that's gone off the scale at 10 millironcgen per hour. Let's flick it, uh, flip it up to the next scale while holding it down, put it there. And it's stopping, I guess it probably overestimates and then sort of zeroes in. So about 50 millironcgen per hour, between 50 and 60 millironcgen per hour. So yeah, pretty damn hot, but as we know, the DP63 had a pretty sort of scary radium screen, which is a bit of a weird thing to do in a Geiger counter. Okay, so that's that. That's giving you a demonstration of that window working, you know, and doing its thing. So what I'm going to do now is try a couple of strontium-90 samples on it, because these might be quite interesting. Because some Geiger counters don't actually read beta on the higher scales. So... First, we'll try the Polish Strontium-90 coin, and I'll keep it on this scale, because I'm pretty sure all of these are going to at least be on this scale. Uh, this is the Polish DP-66's calibration source. So that's on this, assuming it's still calibrated correctly, estimating that about 90 millironcgen per hour, I imagine, because it's between the 80 and 100 slot. And again, it seems some area of this bit is more sensitive than the others. I guess how close it is to the GM tube that's currently taking the reading. I don't actually know on here which is the sweet spot. Actually right in the middle it looks like. Yeah, so that, that's convenient. It's actually right in the middle of the beta window. So, yeah, this one is getting to about 80, 90 millironcgen per hour. Let's try the source from the British um, weird iron chamber I got. Because this is quite a hot source. There we go. Um for what it is anyway. That's getting to about, what's it, 60? Yeah, I don't think the source is as hot as the Polish one, but it's um, like a smaller source, so per size it's hotter. And this one you can sometimes get a bit closer to beta windows on some detec detectors. So that's probably why this one sometimes seems hotter, just simply because it gets closer to the detection windows. But there you go. The interesting thing is, look, the that responds very quickly to that coming into contact with the window. That's good. Right, now let's try, try that Chinese check source. The one that came in the um, Type 75. And what you can see I've done now, I've got some sellotape around it just to make sure nothing leaks out of it. And as you can see, woo, that's, that's very hot on here. That is getting to, if I can hold it in place, close to 200 millironcgen per hour. Yeah, about 180 or so 
milli Ronk and Prowl. And what should happen if I close this flap and put it there, the reading should be much, much lower if anything gets through, because it should only be very hard beater or bracken strallum getting through now. So yeah, on the low scale, you can tell that's above background, but on the high scale, you know, that, that flap is good, it does its job. Again, if I put that back there, you've got that sort of result. What I want to try and do though, is what happens if I, it's a bit awkward because you have to keep the button held down. What happens if you have several sources next to it at once? Will that make it even more powerful? Or does the beta amount sort of overload at a certain number? That's what I'm quite curious about. It's going over 200 now. Yeah. Let me try this with the radium scale at the same time. Because those are the hottest things that I can put it put on it. Um, that's that there. But actually, the radium scale takes up most of the window. There we go. That's about as high as I think I'm going to get it to go. So I don't know if it's that it only counts beta up to around 200, 250 milli Ronkgen. Because it might be at that stage it goes to the top tube. So what I can do is if I put it on this one, can we even see any needle drift? If not, I would assume that it counts only gamma, the top end tube. Yeah, I don't know if there's any drift there or not. You always get a bit of needle drift with analog circuits. But yeah, I'm assuming what it is then, is that this only um, counts beta up to a certain point. So if anybody has one of these and want to um, test it with a really, really strong beta source, like a lab source, if you're qualified to do that, Please do, I'd be very interested in knowing where the top end range of this is. So, there you go. That is the Swiss um, Landis and Gia, what was it called, EMB3, I think was the name of it. Yeah, EMB3. A very, very well-made guy counter from the Cold War. You know, one of the best I've seen, because it does beta and gamma. Has a very good beta window, which actually does block out most of the beta, unlike some Geigers, where either it lets some through, you know, or when you open it, it doesn't let enough beta through. And um, it goes all the way from background radiation to 100 Ronkgen per hour and doesn't seem to have any dead zones on it, you know, where you can tell it's higher than something but not as high as something else. So there you go. And it's also got a good backlight that you can't really see here, but I'm tempted to put better bulbs in the backlight because, um, you know, you could probably put much more modern efficient bulbs in there rather than little incandescents, like maybe some tiny LED ones. And then this will be visible in a really dark room. So there you go. That's the Swiss Landis and Gia. Uh, EMB free Geiger, whatever it's called. Got it from Germany. It was about 150, 160 pounds with the postage, but I'm very, very pleased with it. It's probably one of the best Cold War Geiger counters I've played with. Because if you imagine, this originally came out in the 1960s. Um, yeah, you know. And the Strontium 90 source in it was apparently originally between 100 and 200 milli Ronkman per hour. So the idea was you'd be on the yellow scale, and then similar to this Chinese one, if I pick it back up again. It would, you know, on the scale, go to probably where this one's finishing. I think, yeah, that, that seems, it's probably very similar in strength bit of Strontium 90 then to this um, Chinese bit. But again, they had similar uses. The idea was just to stress test a, um... Oh yeah, and as I said, there seems to be places on this which are more sensitive than others in the beta window. But, you know, it does give you a good idea, doesn't it? Like saying that's got to 200. But yeah, so there you go. The Swiss Landis and Gear um, Geiger counter, absolutely excellent. If you find one of these for cheap and it's in working condition, I'd definitely recommend picking them up because they still work bloody well today, even like they did, you know, back in the day. And um, it's quite nice to get a really good solid Cold War Geiger counter that's not all that big and heavy, but, you know, works really, really, really well.